So welcome to another short uh, Zero to ASIC interview. And today I'm joined by David Holton. Hi, David. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. Thanks. Um, awesome. It's getting quite late on here. You're in Pacific time, right? Yeah, yeah. So could you um, give us a little bit of background about um, your work? Yeah, sure. Um, so my, my background is in computer security. Um, I started a computer security conference um, back in 1999 uh, called TourCon. And um, most of my background is in um, cryptography, reverse engineering, and um, more recently in hardware security. So I've been doing a lot of glitching and fault injection and things like that. But I have a a pretty big background in FPGAs. I had a startup company where we made FPGA accelerators um, that I was a part of for about 10 years. And so um, so I was pretty, pretty experienced with the digital design end, but always wanted to make an ASIC. So when I saw this class come up, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to get that skill set. Yeah, so you joined us for the first run of the short course that we did uh, about a month ago that was just parts four and five of the normal zero to ASIC course, the open lane and the eFabless submission. Uh, can you just tell us a bit about um, your experience in doing that? Uh, sure, yeah. Well, I, I kind of messed up and missed the whole first day, but um, uh, it was it was super helpful having all the notes and VM and everything all set up. And so, um, uh, yeah, it, it was pretty great because I managed to kind of breeze through some examples. And then um, kind of the, the big issue I ran into was just trying to find a design to work on. So uh, especially within the couple weeks until tape out uh, deadline that we had. So um, uh, yeah, so so actually running through all the demos was was super easy. But um, uh, once I figured out that I wanted to do some sort of uh, glitch detector, um, it was pretty straightforward to uh, once I got my Verilog working um, to run through all the tools and, and get up and going. And so um, yeah, it was a great experience uh, just getting to know how to use all the open source tools and uh, getting the support to kind of quickly figure out um, how to get past any issues that I ran into. So yeah, just an amazing experience. So I wanted to talk to you about your project because um, in the heat of the moment of preparing everything for tape out, I had all these designs coming in and I just needed to make sure they passed all the tests. Um, and uh, you, you, your one had quite an interesting name. It was the hog phase detector. Is that right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think that's how yeah. you pronounce it. I'm not quite sure, yeah. but <laughs> so yeah. And then I um, saw that you'd linked to a paper, and then I I read the paper, and I and it just seemed like a really interesting project. So um, maybe you can tell us um, just a, 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 a tiny intro about it, and then we'll play the video that you prepared. Sure. Yeah. So um, so a lot of what I do nowadays is uh, related to hardware security, where um, we do glitch testing against devices where. Basic idea is that um, if you have a microprocessor that's running some code, and there's a security check in there or something you're trying to bypass, um, you can do things like drop the voltage really quickly. Um, uh, you know, uh, kind of in induce a glitch in the clock, or um, use EMF to try to kind of couple to some of the metal and the bond wires or in, in the actual ASIC to try to you know cause a voltage spike or drop. And basically, you're, you're trying to inject a fault in order to get it to skip an instruction or kind of get it into a, a weird state that maybe um, helps helps you break the security of the device. And so um, there's a number of things you can do with software to mitigate against this. But um, what I was really interested in is uh, seeing if we could actually uh, create a detector in hardware that could detect if somebody is doing one of these types of attacks. And um, there's a number of papers out there uh, outlining how to do this. and this hog phase detector one was, uh, you know, written in 2017, and it's kind of some of the newer research and seemed really interesting, um, and also just a very simple design. So um, I thought it'd be cool to try it out and then uh, characterize it once we get the ASIC back and see how well it performed. Cool. So I'll uh, play the video now, and um, then we'll uh, rejoin after that finishes. Awesome. Hello. I'm here today to talk to you about a project I put together for detecting electromagnetic faults in FPGAs and ASICs, which can be used to protect your design from various attacks such as voltage glitching, clock glitching, electromagnetic fault injection, and body biasing injection. This is all based on a research paper by Jacob Breyer, Shivan Basson, and Wei He that was published in 2017 where they tested using a hog phase detector to detect EMF glitches and demonstrated that it was 93.15% effective and had a very low failure rate of 0 0.0069. The design is fairly straightforward, and so I thought I'd try implementing it 
Let's see if I can get it into the MPW2 as part of Matt Venn's zero to ASIC submission. So the whole idea of this paper is that a phase detector is a common element used in CERTES and PLLs to detect how aligned your data and clock are. This is useful for detecting glitches because if your data and clock are in alignment, any glitch to the clock or data will cause it to come out of alignment and result in our phase detection or alarm signal going high. After implementing this in Verilog, I started testing its ability to detect glitches in the data signal and quickly realized that there were some minor shortcomings with a standard hog phase detector design. In these simulation waveforms, you'll see two implementations of the detector, one triggered on the negative edge of the clock and one on the positive edge. In this, we see our simulated glitch injected in the first half of the negative phase of the clock and both detectors catching it. But then when we uh, try glitching on the second half of the negative phase, only the positive implementation now catches the glitch. If we then go to the positive phase and try the first half, um, we notice that uh, both catch the glitch. And then on the second half of the positive phase, only the negative implementation catches the glitch. Because of this, I included both detectors in my design and allow the user to select which one to use or to use both. It's great that this seems to work in simulation, but if we're making silicon, we should also make sure it works in silicon. Luckily, we can easily test this in an FPGA, which should give us an idea for how this might work on an ASIC. To do this, I programmed a lattice ice stick with the design and used a chip shouter with a four millimeter counterclockwise coil to inject EMF glitches. I then just tuned the position manually until glitches started being detected. On the oscilloscope, we see the waveform of our EMF glitch from the chip shouter, which is triggered by our red glitch signal. You should then see the alarm sig output signal fluctuate, which can be caused somewhat by our oscilloscope probe picking up EMF from the glitch. But then it is properly latched by our alarm latch and our alarm count increases based on the number of detected alarms. If we glitch it more, we see the alarm latch stay high and the count continues to increase. These signals can then be used to reset the device or trigger other countermeasures on the device and demonstrates that the detector seems to work in silicon to some degree at least. After verifying this all worked, I went ahead and submitted my wrap design to Matt Venn's MPW2 submission, and so we should be able to fully characterize the detector when we get chips back later this year. To get more details on this design and stay up to date on further testing, check out the project on GitHub or follow me on Twitter at 0x31337. Thanks. Okay, so we're back and um, I hope you found the video interesting. I certainly did. Um, now, I know that you did some uh, testing with the FPGA, but what's going to be the plan for when you get the ASIC back? Um, I, I guess my, my plan is to, you know, put the ASIC underneath um, the, uh, uh, my chip shouter and see if I can detect some glitches that way. Maybe try um, doing some voltage glitching and clock glitching and just kind of throw whatever I can at it. And, um, and because there's a risk five on there, I kind of also want to run some, some test loops on that and see, um, you know, if I'm skipping instructions on the risk five, if that's caught by the detector and, um, uh, and yeah, just try to kind of map out exactly um, what points uh, are causing the glitches and, and what points are being detected. Um, and another thing I want to try out is because um, the chip we're getting back is a wafer uh, chip scale package, um, we can do body biasing injection, where we basically put a probe down on the chip on the backside and induce a, um, a voltage bias into the substrate. And so we can do really precise uh, glitching that way. And uh, here in our lab, we also have a laser fall injection system, so we can try that as well and see. Uh, if that has any effect so Sounds all sorts like of you've fun got stuff. loads of cool toys there yeah yeah <laughs> so um when you did the test in the fpga were you able to so um for hopefully the video is clear otherwise you could check the paper but essentially there's like a a, a, a wire that has got a bit of a length to it that acts as a tiny delay mm -hmm. um were you able to measure how long that was in the in the as it was laid out in the fpga uh, no, at the, at the time I, yeah, I was just trying to get something in there. So I wasn't, wasn't sure how long that would be, but I figured either way it would be able to detect, you know, voltage and clock glitches and things like that. But, um, yeah, as far as EMF, it, 
we'll, we'll just have to see. And, um, but uh, it sounds like you managed to make some progress in figuring out how to, how to trace that. So, um, yeah. So one of the, one of the problems here is that after the, um, the Verilog goes through open lane and we get the uh, synthesized digital netlist that includes all the standard cells, um, every, like everything, all the wires lose their names. And then it's very difficult to kind of work out where things were. Um, but we've got some help from the Yosis crew and there's like this keep command that you can add to wires or registers. And then um, that actually ended up keeping the names in the, in the netlist. Oh, nice. Now, um, that allowed me to search for the, n the number of the standard cell, like connected to each end. And then I was able to find them in uh, K layout. But I still wasn't totally sure that I actually had highlighted the correct net. Mm -hmm. So um, that would be an interesting next step to see if we can work out a way of actually getting the, the name of the Verilog net into the oh, GDS, yeah. which seems like it should be a simple thing, but I still <laughs> don't know how to do it. Yeah, well, yeah. once we characterize it, it'll be cool to see how our heat map lines up with that net and all the other parts of the design. So being able to reverse that out is going to be really useful once we get it back. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks very much for your time, David. It's super cool talking to you, and yeah, I really look forward to hearing how how uh, how the um, characterization of the ASIC goes. It's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Thanks for having me on.